Last video I talked about the setup and the components. In this video, I'm going to um, start. I'm going to go into some of the core mechanics of the game. So, um, the only thing that we didn't talk about in the setup that I wanted to just cover briefly is the bit of variability that goes into the setup at the beginning of the game. So we have these these deck of contested cards I already talked about. Six of them at the end of the Cold War. Six of those countries were, were essentially or territories were essentially um, sort of pro-Western leaning, and six were still um, had area or had influence in the former Soviet Union. So we would take these deck of contested cards. We take the six that were sort of pro-Western leaning. We would randomly draw one. So we'll just say it was the Baltics, and we would place one European Union influence die in it at the beginning. And then we would draw a second one, let's just say it's the Eastern Balkans, and we place a NATO influence. And then similarly, we, we take the six cards that were, that were pro-Russian or for, associated with the former Soviet Union. We would take two of those six, we would draw those, so in this case, let's say Armenia and Azerbaijan, and we would place um, Russian influence dice in those. So that's just a little bit of uh, variability that goes to the game at the beginning so that each game starts a little bit different. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is at the beginning of the game, each player is going to draw four cards from their country deck. Now, I talked about before that um, each deck is very different, and you'll see that here in the sample cards we draw. So I've, I've shuffled the decks, and we're going to draw some cards here. And I'm actually going to draw through the Europe deck just to have a couple of good examples to talk about. So let's take... Um, Norway and Austria, Germany, Greece. So this is a good, good example. So the Western Europe player will draw four cards from their deck, and they're also going to draw two cards from the for the first uh, event deck. So one thing I should mention is at the beginning of the game, there's a little bit of um, setup that goes into this deck. We're actually going to be sorting them by uh, events that are uh, Russia focused, so the, the the pink sort of color here, and then the events that have a focus to Western Europe, so the green color. And there's an equal number of those, so we'll set we would set up the deck at the beginning of the game, um, and take out some of each of those. So each game, again, from an event perspective, feels a little different. And at the beginning of the game, each player is going to draw a couple of those randomly. So we'll say that those were the that, that was the initial hand uh, for the Western Europe player. And we'll just say this is the initial hand for the Russia player. The Russia player would also draw a couple of events. Okay, so now let's go back to the Western Europe player. We're going to talk about the, the cards in general, and then we'll go through systematically discuss the different actions. So note that each card has a set of actions. I've already mentioned that before. In this case, the yellow ones are associated with the European Union, and the blue ones with NATO. So if we look at, for example, Norway and Austria, the difference here is Norway is part of NATO, so it has NATO actions. Austria is part of the European Union, it only has European Union actions. Then a country like Germany that's part of both has the access to both actions. This is also a good example of the difference in relative strength of countries. So we have Germany, who's one of the most powerful countries in both the European Union and NATO, and they have these very powerful set of actions. Then we have Greece, one of the weakest countries, and a much weaker set of actions. In the sense, it's similar for the Russia player. Um, although they only have Russian actions, you can see that the most powerful card for the Russia player is Moscow. Very set, uh, very uh, powerful set of actions. And then we have the weakest card for Russia, Kaliningrad, which is a very weak card. And I'll go into more about what that means. But now, for now, let's just go and we'll start talking about each individual action. So we'll start with Germany. It's a good card. It has all, all the actions to discuss. So the first action we're going to talk about is that sort of uh, Google Maps looking placement marker. So this means placing new European Union, Union influence. So in this case, the yellow die is European Union influence. We would take it, we could place it in any brown colored country we want. So let's just say, for example, we wanted to place new European Union, Union influence in Ukraine. We would place a dice there. Now, a rule of thumb is anytime you place anything new on the board, anything at all, it's always going to cost you two money to do that. So in this case, we're going to spend two money to place European Union influence in Ukraine. 
So that's that action. Okay, so now let's kind of clean this up and we'll talk about the next, next action, which is increasing existing European Union influence. So we're gonna increase the influence that was already there and influence tax was already there by four points. So we have it, a dice already in the Baltics. We could take an action to increase this to five. And we didn't place anything new on the board, so that doesn't cost anything. We're just gonna take the action to increase it. Now, anytime influence in a country goes up to five or to six, you're gonna have access to the contested um, country card for it. So in this case, we're increasing the Baltics influence to five. So we would go through this deck, we would find the Baltics card, and we would add it to our discards. We now have influence in the Baltics. Now this is important. Um, this is an important difference between the way the Europe, the Western Europe player plays and the Russian player plays. The Western Europe player only has European Union influence in the Baltics. So if we look at this card, it has both European Union and NATO actions. But if this card was to get placed in the discard, then shuffled into the deck and revealed, the player only the because the Western Union player only has European Union influence, they could only use the European Union actions. If they wanted to use those NATO actions, they would have to have NATO influence in the Baltics, also equal to five or six on the dice. So in that regard, you can see that by the Western European Union or Western Europe player adding cards, these contested cards to their deck, they have to balance the investment and they have to uh, also invest both NATO and European Union dice if they want to have full access to the, the uh, actions there. Okay. The next action is money. So the European money is tied to the European Union. So if they play this action, they're just gonna take four money. That's very simple. You just grab four money, put it into your, your um, stock there. Okay, the next action is placing new NATO influence. It works exactly like placing European Union influence. So you would just take a die, say you place it in Hungary, and because you're placing a new thing on the board, you'd spend two money. The next is increasing influence. So in this case, it would be increasing it by four. You could uh, increase the influence of an existing die by four. So in this case, you would increase influence to five. And again, you would take the card. So you would just take the Eastern Balkans card and now you could play it when it comes up. But again, you'd only have access to the NATO actions. Next, we have this gear. That means building a new army. Now this is, the, this is important. This is the only action in the game where the action is tied to the country's card that's playing it. So if you play the Germany card to build an army, the army you build has to be placed in Germany. So you would place a new army, note that you're taking an item, a physical component, placing it on the board, rule of thumb, you're paying two money to do that. So you'd place, pay two money to build an army, it has to go into Germany. Okay, and then the last action in the game is moving an army. So this is the two little arrows here means move an army. You can play that. It doesn't have to be in Germany. It's not tied to the country. So you can move any army, any NATO army in, on the board. You can move it a space. So let's say we wanted to move this army in Italy to Austria. You can take that action and move that. Now you can continue moving. So let's say we wanted to take this army in Italy and move it to, to Ukraine. It would move one, two, three spaces. The first one would be free. For each additional space you move is two money. So in this case, you'd spend two money to send that army to Ukraine. Now is a good time to talk about these C spaces. So we've, we've labeled the C spaces, we've divided the board up. C spaces are very easy. They just work exactly like land spaces. So if you wanted to move this Italian uh, army in Italy to Georgia, for example, you could move into Eastern Mediterranean, that would be free. Turkey would be one money, and Georgia would be two money. Okay, so that's all the actions in the game. Um, we've talked about the uniqueness of the Western Europe player and how they have to juggle the um, European Union actions and the NATO actions. The Russia cards have the exact same set of actions. There's no different actions for Russia. They just don't have the difficulty of having to juggle those two different types of the European Union and NATO. So what that means is in a, in a typical turn, uh, each player is going to pick two cards. They want to play two of their country cards. So let's say the European, the Western Europe player wants to play, uh, they want to use their Germany card and their Greece card. 
And let's say, for example, the Russia player wants to play their Mos Moscow card and their Kaliningrad card. They would each secret secretly pick the two cards. They would show that they've decided on what those are. And then they would announce, once they both decided, they would announce to the other player what their initiative is. Initiative is this value, the, the value in the white circle. So Germany is 7, Greece is 3, so the total is 10. So the Western Europe player announces they have 10. And the Russia player announces they have 8. The player with the higher initiative has to play their actions first. And this is important. They don't win initiative and get to decide who goes first. They have to play first. And it's an extremely uh, important tactical decision throughout the game because sometimes you want to go first and sometimes you'll want to go second. So the um, Europe player has higher initiative. They have to go first. So they come out and they want to play one action from each card. And once they've resolved those two actions, the Russia player will then take, and then they'll discard those cards. So they've already, um, they would have a discard pile here. They'll add those to it once they play their actions. The Russia player then will take their two cards. They'll play both their actions. They will discard those two cards. And then we're going to look here at the, the um, event tracking board and the turn tracking board. So the, the turn track says that in period one on the first turn, it's color-coded green, which means it's the Western Europe player's turn to play a, uh, an event. So they're going to place a new event. They can choose either event in their hand. So in this case, they have two options. They have the Bosnian War and the Kosovo War. These are very similar events. They can place either one they want. So let's say they place the Bosnian War here. Um, also, I should point out at this point, it's, it's easy to say, since the events are randomly dealt, it's possible that the Western Europe player could have had two events that are actually uh, Russia-focused. They would score points for Russia. So let's say that the um, Western Europe player had drawn these as two events. They would be forced to put one of these two events into play. These two events can only, uh, if they come true, they can only give... Uh, victory points to the Russian player. And that's possible. It's, it's uh, Throughout the course of the game, you're going to have to make tough decisions about which event of your opponents you want to put into play uh, quite frequently. So um, we'll just carry this example forward, though. So we're going to say that the Western Europe player put the Bosnian War event into play. Now, what that means is it's put into play in the first turn. Then the uh, at the end of the turn... Both players are going to redraw their hands, like their country cards, up to four. So the Russia player and the... Um, I shouldn't have drawn from my discards there. So they'll draw it from their deck, obviously. And they draw their hands back up to four. And because the Western Europe player played an event, he's going to draw his event back up to two. And that will be the end of the round. Okay. The turn marker will advance. The event marker will also advance. We'll do the exact same thing. So each player will program two cards. They'll play out the events. And now in this turn, we have this color-coded red. So the Russia player will get to pick an event. So we're just going to say, for example, they pick this event. Turn three will happen. Turn four will happen. And by this point, each player will have continued to play events and backfill events. So... Turn five is the first time that that sequence changes a bit. So what's going to happen in turn five is that um, the players are going to, excuse me for one second. The players are going to play through the round as normal. And then before a new event is placed, we're going to check to see if this event has resolved. So the marker would have advanced, players would have placed new events, the marker would get to this point, it would be a new turn for the Western Europe player to place an event, but before that happens, we'll look to see if this condition in the Western Balkans is true. So now keep in mind we've had four turns where both players knew that this event was going to come up. So they've had four turns to plan for this eventuality. So over the course of the game, we might have a situation, or over the course of the first four turns, we might have a situation like this, where we have 
Russia has played five Russian influence. The Western Europe players played four NATO and one European Union. So the, the once the actions have been resolved for this turn, we'll look, we'll say, okay, the uh, Western Europe player does not have more NATO influence than Russia in the Western Balkans. And if that's the case, this card is discarded. It never goes to the Western Europe player. However, had this been the situation, and yes, indeed, there was more NATO influence than Russia influence. This card would go to the Western Europe player. They would secretly hold it for the rest of the game, and they would have one victory point at the end. And that's really it. From here on out, what's going to happen is this will check to see if this is true, and then the Western Europe player will put a new event into play. And for the rest of the game, there will always be four events in play at any given time, and both players will always have four turns to... Um, account for those events. So in some regards, the game is very tactical because you're going to be constantly jockeying for which of these events you want to um, try to win. But at the same time, there's a, a, a significant amount of strategy because you have four turns to play for it. And independent of the, the events, you're also going to be um, jockeying for influence in these contested countries because Whichever country has uh, the greatest amount of influence, like I talked about at the end of each period, is going to get extra victory points for that. And that's really the, the core of the game. The only thing I didn't discuss is um, combat. And so one thing I should mention about combat is it, we use the term uh, very abstractly. It doesn't necessarily mean that NATO and Russia has come into combat in a country. Really what it's, what it's representing is that at any given point, only either NATO or Russia almost certainly will have any sort of sizable military presence in any contested country. So, for example, let's say the Western Europe player has placed a couple of armies in Ukraine. And the Russia player takes an action. They're going to take a uh, use this card to use a move action, and they're going to move an army. The combat is uh, simple and deterministic. If an army moves in, then that army goes away and so does one of the opponent's armies. It's as simple as that. There's no combat rolls, there's no um, long drawn out process. It's deterministic and simple. So let's say this army was to move in, both would be eliminated and now Russia could, if they had enough, if they had an, an action to do this, they could come in and have army in, in Ukraine. And that's, that's it. That's all, that's the only way that uh, combat works. The only other thing to really talk about here is how do you remove uh, dominance of a country? Um, so let's say I talked about the fact that only one player can have a six in a country at any given point. So the Western Europe, if they have um, sixes of European Union and NATO influence in the Ukraine, Russia cannot have a six unless you can have it as a five. So how can it ever achieve dominance now in Ukraine? The way you do that is by moving an army into a country. So if there's no NATO army, if there was a NATO army and it was here and a Russian army moved in, they would both just be eliminated instantly. They would both go away. If there was no NATO army, the army would move in, it would knock the influence down to five, and the army would be sacrificed. But now that gives the Russia player the opportunity to then boost their influence to six, and now they have dominance. And that's the only way to lower dominance. You can't come in and knock this five down to four. You'll always maintain at least the influence of five in a country. And because of that, these cards that go into your deck will always be usable throughout the course of the game. You can't force a player who's um, placed influence in the country to lose the use of those cards. And that's really the, um, the entirety of the game. You can see here that the last few colors, uh, colored spaces of the, the second era or the second uh, period are white, and that's simply just saying that you're not going to place new events in those because they would never have time to resolve anyway. So at the end of the game, all of the events that have been placed in the play will have been resolved. We'll have done, um, we'll have checked for dominance in countries twice. Players will have kept those victory points, and they will add those together at the end, and that's how you determine the winner. Okay, so that's it for this video. In the next one, I'm going to um, just have a couple of sample walkthrough rounds.